Mike is behind it, it would seem by the silence that you are all ready to engage in this wonderful evening. My name is Michael Kalker. I would like to welcome you this evening to the fifth year of A Common Heart. It's been a wonderful journey, and we're so glad that you could join us this evening and continue on this journey with us. As we enter into this evening, we'd like to take a moment of silence right now and invite God, as we know him, to be a part of this evening with us. Thank you. As I said a moment ago, it was five years ago, probably more, the, more like closer to six, that this journey started uh, through an individual at the Church of St. Benedict, Roman Catholic Church, named Margaret Tolley. And she was doing a project for some work in the church, and God placed on her heart uh, the idea of bringing a dialogue together between these three faiths of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. And from that one person being inspired to do that, we are here this evening, five years later, continuing this journey, as I said also earlier. So again, it's a blessing to have you with us tonight. A couple housekeeping things. If you do need a restroom, uh, as you exit the doors, if you go to the right and follow the hallway along, you'll find restrooms out that way. Uh, we do have some snacks out there for intermission time for you to enjoy. And speaking of intermission, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions to our panelists this evening. Those questions can be centered around the topic of this evening, who is God, or they can be general questions uh, that would engage any of the faiths and questions you have regarding those faith expressions. We have on the back of your program, as you notice, um, some basic principles for interfaith dialogue. These are principles that we've applied to this dialogue over the years and have helped it to be a healthy one and one of understanding one another and growing in relationship with one another. I can tell you that the team that plans this Common Heart event has become very close and we would consider each other friends and it's been a wonderful to get to know each other to that level. This evening is also being recorded and will be available on YouTube and we will spread that um, information out via various channels so that others can watch as well. Um, so we do ask you to, uh, to refer to the principles when you're writing questions or even when you're engaging in conversation with someone you may have not met before tonight and uh, you have that opportunity to get to know one another as an audience as well. So with all that said, I'd like to now introduce our Master of Ceremonies for this evening. We weren't professional this year with our Master of Ceremonies. I, I don't want to... Mike, you do Muhammad first? Or is Joe she, will, she will introduce, okay. yes. Couldn't remember. I don't want to disappoint you, but I will not be the Master of Ceremonies this evening. Again, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Joe Painter, who is the General Manager of WEEU 830A Annum. And I'm sure many of you uh, will know her from her afternoon program every day, the Joe Painter Show, where she engages Berks County in exciting dialogue and interaction, and where you can hear her smiling voice. Uh, she is a graduate of Penn State University with a degree in business administration, and she presents career programs for students interested in communications and has worked with the American Business Women's Association, the American Association of University Women, the Boy Scouts Career Program, and the Berks Senior College. She has been a featured speaker for the Berks County Chamber of Commerce Women in Leadership Series and the communications presenter for the Rotary Club's Yearly Youth Generation Conference. She is committed to, to the community and has served on numerous nonprofit boards and volunteered for countless local organizations. She is an active member at Immaculate Conception Church as a lector and women's club member. And Joe also specializes in voiceover talent for commercial and video production, keynote speeches, and MC services through JP Productions. 
So will you join me in welcoming Joe Painter, where we can actually see her smile in person this evening. It wasn't professional, this is what you got. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's been a riot the last couple of, it's been a riot the last couple of days. Um, I, I have to say I'm extremely, extremely honored to be here. I got a phone call um, to, to uh, attend a Common Heart Committee meeting, and it evolved to this, long story short. And I was just at a live broadcast um, at, at um, Hearthstone at Amity. So I'm coming up 422, and as I'm coming up, I was thinking, what, what could I say? What could I possibly say um, when I'm with this panelist, uh, very esteemed, who, who are theologians? They know the answers, and I'm feeling quite unqualified to tell you the truth. So I did what I usually do, and I said, oh, God, help me out. I, I don't know. I'm simply an instrument. You gave me whatever you gave me. Now use it, please. And I no sooner said that, and I looked up, and there's this big black billboard, and it said, do you know where you're going? <laughs> and underneath it, it said, God. And I just stood and laughed, and I was like, all right. And it was funny on a couple of levels, because literally, I wasn't really sure. I promised Joe Pressman when I'd drive by, so I knew where I was going, and I, I never did that, Joe, but she promised me there was signs. I figured I'd, I'd get there. And I got to thinking about that. I thought, OK, God's speaking here tell me what to say, and then I thought, it's not about the destination, God, it's about the journey, here I am telling God, right? Um, and I get to thinking about that, here we are, we are on a journey together. And, and Michael, you said it, it started because um, uh, God spoke to, to a woman's heart, and she decided to put this together, and I think five people got together, and they said, let's walk. And they said, let's walk in peace, because when there are differences, it, it brings fear. And that fear brings another emotion that is anything but peaceful or logical. And, and here's a group of, I believe it was five people, that decided to walk in peace. Look around. My goodness, it grew, didn't it? The dialogue grew. And, and we find we want to walk in peace. So this is about finding that common that common place, that common heart is the most beautiful thing, and I feel a wonderful energy. I want to thank you very much for being uh, inviting me to be part of this. Um, we started talking about it on WEU. Uh, there were two times now we've had a, a dialogue, a 45-minute program, talking about common heart last year and again last week. And it was on feedback, and Mike Faust in discussing it said, so who is God? That's what it's about. Well, the phone lines lit up. They lit up because everybody knows who God is in their own heart. So as I was saying, I'm unqualified. I, I know who I think God is. We all know who we think God is. And um, we do what we do in radio. We record stuff and take snippets out and play it back. And uh, Michael, I heard one from you uh, from the program. And I think you were pretty succinct. And I can't quote you, uh, but essentially you said, God is who I need him to be. And, and he probably is at any given time, whether or not we know it, he's there for us. It's a pretty cool thing. So it, it's also grown not only from this room, uh, but the Common Heart program has now embraced our youth, which is huge. And I understand they've gotten together. And I'm looking forward, if you want to hear more, on March 9th, our Voices Teen program will um, be composed of a panelist of three youth from Common Heart. And uh, on that note, I would like to welcome to the podium this evening Mohamed Sumo to talk about the youth activities that are happening with Common Heart. I think he's here this evening. Yes. Hi. I'm very happy. I'm always inspired by the youth as they talk on the radio, and they are the future, very, very bright and often inspiring. Please welcome Mohamed Sunno. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? What about that weather, huh? I know. Kind of cold. I came in here, I was like, thank God he made heat, you know? So, <laughs> as you can see on the board here we have some pictures of the youth group that we uh, attended um, not too long ago. Um, uh, common, the Common Heart Youth Group is a association where teenagers come together and we talk about our religions. Uh, for Jewish people we talk about 
what Jewish practice and Muslims and Christians. And <clears throat> is this, we talk about like what we practice and like holidays we, we, uh, we do and different things like that. Um, so one of the important things that we talk about is like stereotypes about what people, like what people name other people. Like for Muslims, they'll be terrorists, or for Jews, like all Jews are rich and greedy people, which is not always true. And, <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, it's not, well, <laughs> we, find, uh, we finalize that, and um, <laughs> we, um, we let's just like, get to the bottom of what we really are, and... And basically, we're just all one people, of course. Where nobody's better than anybody, nobody's lower than anybody. Okay. All right. So, um, it's a very it's a very comfortable environment. We encourage everybody to talk. Anybody who's shy, I mean, they come in and they. Well, I was shy at first, but I loosened up, and and then we have these groups that we go into. It's more about maybe 30 people would come and then we split up into these groups and then everybody's in their own station of groups and it's like more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation of what your religion is and it's more like extra information that you get and so far so on and the dinner time we have is astonishing food thanks to brother Muzuki's restaurant um, we get together, we talk more on a personal level of what school you're in and what, what grade you're in and things you want to be. And it's just a very social, interactive place where people, kids can meet together and learn at the same time having fun while learning. And did I mention the food is great? <laughs> uh, and it's just... It's, it's, it's a very, very, very educational, fun way to learn, and I wish this goes on. And I actually would like anybody who was in a youth group to stand up, if anybody's here. And there they are. Can we have a round of applause for them, please? Right. Um, thank you for, for the speech, and... Have a great night. Thank you very, very much. It is a brave thing to do, um, to uh, be amongst other teenagers and get together and talk from the heart about your faith. And so this opportunity that was provided. I would be remiss if I, if I didn't mention the names Margaret Tully and Joe Pressamone and Rabbi Michelson and uh, El Sayed Stephen Wazuki and um, Father Phil, because that is the original group. There's your core group that said, let's do it. And, and so we're going to do it. And I would invite you after this evening to come home and um, share the dialogue and share what you've learned with your friends. And this will only grow and get bigger and better. So who is God is the topic. There have been different topics. This is the fifth program. And uh, I think there were some faith, women of faith in, in discovering the texts of, of the, uh, the um, holy word of God in the different religions. I've learned already, because I said, well, what's the order to Joe Pressamon? She said, well, it's going to be chronological. And it has nothing to do with their age, I promise you. It's, it's the, the faiths that were first and then the ones that came after. So I learned something right, on, right out of the gate. And these gentlemen this evening will present to you who is God um, against the backdrop of their faith. And the faiths that we're exploring are the three faiths of Abraham. So we'll start this evening with Rabbi Brian Michelson. And Rabbi Michelson is a local graduate from Franklin and Marshall College here in Lancaster. And he also served in Australia. He is currently uh, the leader of um, the, the Reformed? Reform. No ED. 
Rufo Sihon, another one. Rufo Temple, Loheb Shalom. Very active in that group and very active with family and youth in that group. So, why don't you please welcome Rabbi Michelson? We'll learn who is God from that backdrop. Rabbi? Mohammed didn't say this before, but if I just can respond to add one thing to what he said. Uh, having been there to watch the youth participate together, what was incredible was how quickly they moved into the ability to talk to each other and become friends with each other. As the adults, we got together and there were a number of meetings and we were all very nicely behaved and, you know, and, and, and talked, very, you know, talked very intellectually. The kids just dove right in. We had given uh, the groups a couple of uh, starter questions figuring that they might have some difficulty with uh, finding what to start, what to talk about. Well, as you w walked around to the various groups, um, one, of the, one of the groups was reported saying was, they gave us these questions, but we'll get to them later. I, what I want to really know is, which was exactly the purpose of why we were trying to bring them together. And so I give them a great deal of credit for coming together and sharing in a way that was truly fearless. And that truly gives me hope for the future. Yeah. Now I can give you a very short answer as to who is God. The very short answer is, I have no idea. <laughs> and the reason I say that is not because the issue is about God. The issue is much more about me. It is about my limitations and my inability to necessarily understand all that God possibly can be. Uh, how do I put the ineffable into language? And so I struggle with how do we define God? Um, it is how do you fathom something that is incomprehensible? You will find that a belief in God varies from Jew to Jew, depending on their personal experiences, what they have seen. But I personally find I relate to a comment made by Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. Uh, Heschel was one of the great theologians of the 20th century within Judaism. And he said, God is of no importance unless he's the su of supreme importance. And for me, that quote actually speaks to my understanding of God. God is meant to be at the very center of who I am, what I do, and why I do it. As a Jew, I believe I live in a covenantal relationship with God. I do for God and God does for me. And therefore, God must be part of why I do what I do. The way that I dress, the way that I eat, the way that I think, the holidays that I celebrate. All are inclusive of God being part of it for me. Some Jews will tell you they don't believe in God. And Judaism says, okay. Ultimately, what we, are, what we are held accountable for is our actions. We, what we believe, we follow through with the way we act. The variety of understandings of God can be God as the creator and God as parent, God as ruler and God as judge. There is a tradition that says God has no less than 70 faces. Right. And the reason for those 70 faces is that it depends on which face we need at a particular moment in time that governs what experience of God we need. Do we, get, do we need God to comfort us? Do we need God to be our friend? Do we need God to judge us? Do we need God just to simply walk with us? All of those are valid faces of God and are all the same God, but different experiences of it. It is not because God changes, but it is because we change. We come at it with different insight and different needs, and therefore the God that we relate to also becomes different. One of the great modern challenges is how do we understand and see God in our world and reconcile the issue of evil when we see it around us? If we believe that God is omnipotent and all-powerful, how come we see evil people prosper and good people suffer? There is no easy answer to the question, um, but I am always drawn back to the work of a man by the name of Emil Fackenheim. 
Fackenheim was a Holocaust survivor, uh, and I had the opportunity to study with him briefly. And Fackenheim taught, deal, dealt with the question of where was God during the Holocaust? And I think we can ask on a, on a more recent understanding, where was God on 9-11? And Fackenheim's response is, God does not take the power, does not choose to take the power to override our ability to make free choices. We have free will. And we must allow each other that ability to make choices, whether they be good or bad. God must allow us to make those bad choices. But where was God? God was in the camps with those who were suffering. God was in the hands of those who did small and random acts of kindness. God was in the person who looked the other way while a note was passed from family member to family member. On 9-11, God was in the hands of those who volunteered and dug rubble, looking for survivors, looking for those who had died. God was in those places, and we were not aware of it. Judaism teaches that we live in a golden mean, that most things are not good or bad in and of themselves, but rather the, what we do with them. I always use the example of, of alcohol. Within Judaism, wine is often used as a symbol of celebration. We use it at weddings, at, at, at bar mitzvahs, at baby namings, at, at circumcision ceremonies. It is meant to be sweet and to be joyful. Yet at the same time, we are reminded that too much of it is a damaging thing. It's not about being good or bad. It's about how much. It's about finding where you can walk that line in between. I also find that I sometimes have to remind myself of that when I sit down to eat, right? Because we need food to live. If we were to give up food completely, what hope do we have? But gluttony at the same time is not seen as a Jewish value. It is neither, food itself is neither good or bad. It's what we do with it. And Judaism has a similar belief to some extent about that is the way God operates. Between justice and mercy, between peace and disharmony, between creation and destruction, none of these things by themselves are necessarily good or bad. It's about finding the way down the middle. Ultimately, and I can only speak personally here, is I believe that God is compassion and judgment, graciousness and kindness, truth and forgiveness. What do I believe? I believe that these are the qualities that God wishes us to emulate, that we are told that we are made in the image of the divine. How do we live out that? By following and living out these values, by being compassionate, by being gracious, by being kind and truthful, and always remember, to find, always remember to be able to give forgiveness. If we do those things, I think we have the opportunity to know who God is. We relate to God, we see God, and we are blessed. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Michelson. Are you feeling... Common threads, common threads. That is, who is God? The backdrop of Judaism. We're going to explore who is God in the backdrop of Christianity next. And I would like to welcome to the podium, um, the Common Heart Podium, Reverend Philip Rogers, fondly and lovingly known as Father Phil. Among his uh, congregation, he has an uncommonly huge heart. He's been a priest for 28 years, served as a, a, a teacher, I do believe, also a parish priest, and works with teens, worked with and still does, very dedicated to teens in, in his parish at St. Benedict's, and also involved with um, the, the Family First program, which I believe you are as well, Rabbi Michelson. So please welcome to the podium, Father Phil. Good evening.
evening, everyone. And I want to offer a special welcome again to Dr. Blackenship, who is with us tonight. This is the second time he is with us, and we're very happy that you are here. Yes. And I also want to acknowledge the, the great charism and the strength of Rabbi Brian. It's been wonderful working with him over these years, and I, I'm very grateful for the enthusiasm and the great desire and the wonderful heart that he brings to our program. <clears throat> William James, 1842 to 1910, a noted American psychologist and philosopher, made an interesting observation in his book, Pragmatism. There is, it must be confessed, a curious fascination in having deep things talked about, even though neither we nor the disputants understand them. Tonight we talk about deep things. Who is God? The suffering of our incarnate God. Sin, grace, the enigma of the cross, glory and resurrection, the nature of God. Deep things indeed are difficult to fathom and comprehend. Yet we must speak about them because they are the core of our faith life. I thank you for all coming tonight. Together we are curious and we ponder the mystery of God. Too often we, do, we are distracted by superficial entertainment and waste our time on inane matters. TV and media sometimes catch us off guard and we're led down that, that road and uh, to just watch and be as absorbed by the absurd. Down through the centuries we hold a curious fascination about God this seems to always increase when our culture embraces the opposite. We see that today with a growing number of people who are claiming to be atheists. It forces the question for all of us, well, what do I believe? When we Catholics gather for worship every Sunday, we, at one point in our liturgy, we profess our faith. We have cards that that we can pick up and we read together. And it's the profession of our faith, it's the Nicene Creed. This creed is made up of 12 profound, deep statements of faith. Sometimes this creed is too hard for people to understand. So the Holy Saints would think up of ordinary ways to help the ordinary people understand the mystery of God as reflecting in our belief that there is one undivided God in three persons. We call this mystery Trinity. St. Patrick was one of those people, one of the saints of our, of our faith. His feast day will celebrate next month. And when he stood before the common people, he plucked from the ground a shamrock, and he held it up. And he says, see this? It's one plant with three leaves. And help people to understand and reflect. There's one God with three divine persons. Another simple analogy was a man can be a father with children. He can be an uncle with nieces and nephews. He can be a brother. The same person can relate to other people in three different ways. So what do we really believe when we profess one God in three persons? God is Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth creator of the universe, source of goodness and holiness. All things come from God. Jesus taught us a prayer called the Our Father. In that, he gives us an image of a very intimate relationship with a loving parent who knows his children and what they need. <coughs> Father Karl Rahner, 1904 to 1984, one of the most brilliant theologians of the 20th century, wrote extensively on the mystery of the Trinity. He spoke of an imminent Trinity, the very inner life of God, and an economic Trinity, the activity of God. It is through what God does that we come to know who God is. We believe God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, into the world. Jesus, for us, 
is the second person of the Trinity. For Christians, Jesus is the central revelation of the very mystery of God. Jesus is the Redeemer. We believe that the Word, God's Word, became flesh in the birth of Jesus of Nazareth 2,000 years ago. We believe Jesus is fully human and fully divine. We believe that Jesus, for three years, as a young adult in his early 30s, went about preaching and healing and proclaiming the kingdom of God. In Jesus, God now has a face. Through his redemptive work, Jesus calls sinners to repentance and offers them peace that is far beyond our understanding. Jesus is our Redeemer, our divine physician. When we follow Jesus in authentic discipleship, we are called to repair what is broken and restore to wholeness that which is injured. In the Eucharist, our worship of sharing bread and wine, Jesus comes to eat and drink with saints and sinners, with the righteous and the unrighteous, with every disciple. For that table fellowship, we give thanks. For that table fellowship, we experience the very life of God, be it eminent or economic. Trinity, sometimes called the community of God. In that statement, there is plural and singular at the same time. It includes Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The third person of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. More has been written about the Holy Spirit in the last 50 years than in the last 2,000 years of Christianity, partially from the teachings of the Vatican II in the 1960s. We believe and recognize the Holy Spirit of God is the divine calling to enter into a personal relationship with the living God. We believe the Holy Spirit spoke through the prophets, calling all of us down through the ages to faithfulness. We believe, the Holy, we believe the Holy Spirit came down upon the apostles on Pentecost and changed the church from a scared, hiding church to a brave and courageous church that proclaims and gives witness to a deep abiding belief in Jesus as Lord and Savior. We pray to the Holy Spirit to lead us in knowledge of God, to recreate us and breathe life into our faith and help, and help us to believe. When I think of who God is, I am personally moved to praise God when I stand at the edge of the ocean in Atlantic City or gaze into the night sky on my backyard deck, or stand at the beginning of Death Valley and look out into the desert over the vastness, I think how awesome and majestic is God in all of his creation. I am personally moved to thank God when I look into my heart and see my own sins and go to another priest to make confession and celebrate reconciliation in God's merciful love and ask Jesus to forgive me. At that moment, when I sense God has forgiven me and he still calls me his beloved creation, I thank and praise God. I am personally moved to worship God when prompted by the Holy Spirit to pray silently in my heart and know that God exists and he calls me to serve. That moment when I say yes to be a priest again, to be a disciple of Jesus, an agent of healing and reconciliation, an instrument of his peace, I thank God for coming into my life and making his ways known to me by the grace and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. It is fascinating 
that though we cannot fathom the depth of deep things, we are curious about them. For Christians, the triune God is the deepest reality. We believe through prayer and reflection we might come to a deeper knowledge of God Almighty and God's providential and merciful love for us. Who is God for us? God is love. And the person who abides in love abides in God and God in them. Thank you. Thank you, Father Phil. I'm feeling as I'm listening this evening. You get up in the morning and your shade's drawn. And you raise it a little bit. And some light comes in. And you raise it a little bit more. And some more light comes in. And then you just yank the shade and it goes up. And there's all the glory. And that's what we're experiencing tonight. A little light came in uh, about who is God from, from uh, the background of Judaism. And who is God from the background of Christianity. And now we're going to fling it all the way open and find out who is God in the backdrop of Islam. It is our pleasure to welcome to the podium tonight a gentleman who spent and dedicated his life studying um, Islamic and Middle Eastern studies and um, American history with that. He is a tenured associate professor of religion at Temple University, and he's traveled the world in his studies, spending time in Egypt, Mecca, and Saudi Arabia. Would you please welcome Dr. Blankenship. Thank you, and um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, when we come to discuss the question of who is God from the Muslim point of view, the first thing we want to say is that God as the concept in Islam is similar and parallel to God as the concept in Judaism and in Christianity. And we have to preface our remarks by that because uh, some people try to portray things as being the contrary and that, that uh, our God is different than their God and so on. Actually, the Muslim uh, name of God in Arabic, Allah, is the same word that is used by Arabic-speaking Christians and is also used by Arabic-speaking Jews, which suggests that it's not uh, a different God. So in Christian translations of the Bible in Arabic, it says Allah, wherever it says God. It's just the Arabic word for God, that's all. The word God actually is a Germanic term meaning the invoked one. Allah is related to the ancient Semitic name El uh, for the high God that is found in the uh, exalted uh, form of Hebrew Elohim, uh, which honors God by putting his name in the plural, I presume. And so we have to say, first of all, we have generally a shared concept of God that uh, transcends the three religions. Having said that, though, on the other hand, there also is the uh, equal fact that the reception of God by different individuals is different. And that uh, the two ways of looking at religion, as I tell my students, uh, if you look at it from the top down, you, it, that is, you go to someone and ask them, well, what's your concept of God? from any of our religions. And they might say, as a lay person, well, go ask the religious specialist. You know, go ask the head of the, of the religion, or, or, you know, the high person in the religion, because they will give you a better answer than I can give. But then you can, and that would be looking at it from the top down, where you'd say, you know, what is the authority that has been written in this religion that said that you know, the belief system shall be this and this and this, and the creeds and their elaborations and all that. But if you say instead, no, I want to know what you think. You tell me what's your concept of God. How actually does God work for you? And then you'll get a lot of different answers. You can possibly get everyone united on the concept of God. And, of course, in 
Islam, the uh, concept of God has to be, in some sense, undefined, because uh, God, as absolute and transcendent being of all, can't uh, be divided, is not divisible into characteristics, hence the Muslim concept of Tawheed, which is that God is one. And God is one itself can be taken as a, a negative predication. In other words, God is indivisible, cannot be divided into any divisions. And if you cannot divide something, you cannot analyze it. This is a point that is very important and significant. So we have the terms like God is ineffable, as the rabbi said, uh, or his ways are inscrutable as a, a, another uh, Orthodox a, a Jewish Talmudic scholar actually uh, said to me, and I can agree with that. His ways are inscrutable. God is unknown in that sense. In fact, some people said, who or what is God? That we should address rather than say, what is God, rather than who is God, because who is God makes God into a person. And maybe God is a what rather than a who. So that would be a, another kind of point of view that one could take. Now, there is a, a kind of attack on religion that emerges out of uh, scientism, which is based on the ancient materialist uh, idea that came down as a, a, a the, the pedigree from uh, Xenophanes to Lucippus to Democritus to Epicurus to Lucretius, that is the uh, materialist viewpoint. So everything is just a material flux, and there's nothing, no particular change, nor any uh, uh, thing ordering it, uh, and, and that is the uh, kind of view that is held. And so uh, people will come up and say, well, we discovered all these things about the universe, and huge dimensions of the universe, and so on, so you know, where is God? As like the Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, the first person to orbit the Earth, said, I went up there and I didn't see God. <laughs> and so the, um, that question is a, a kind of question that arises owing to the uh, transformations of modern science. And I do at Temple teach a course entitled uh, Religion and Science. And the uh, fact is that my reception of that is that quite the opposite, that the hugeness of the universe does not diminish God, but magnifies God more greatly. All of the knowledge we have gained and so on magnifies God in the transcendental sense to greater and greater dimensions. In the Quran it says, وَسْيَا كُرْسِيُوا السَّمَرَاتِ الْأَرْضِ His seat encompasses the heavens and the earth encompasses all the heavens, encompasses all the earth. That's only his seat. That is the thing he is, you know, uh, uh, metaphorically portrayed as sitting on the kursi. And then there's the arsh, which is greater than the kursi, is like the throne. And it, it, so that in the hadith it says that the, um, the, the kursi, the seat, is uh, in, can, in relationship to the, the arsh, or the throne, is like a ring thrown in the sea. And so the, uh, and that's only the throne. That's not God either. And based on some of the Quranic verses, one might understand that the, and the seven heavens, that the entire visible universe that we know is contained entirely in the first heaven. As it says, We have beautified the lowest heaven with lamps. So the stars, all of the visible universe is only in the lowest heaven, and the other six, six heavens are other dimensions that we don't know anything about and we can't approach. And so these are just the, uh, the heavens, which are completely encompassed by the seat, which is lesser than the throne, and all of that is lesser than God. So God is so great. Or to put it in another sense, if you thought of our entire universe as being a subatomic particle in another larger universe, and then that universe is a subatomic particle in another universe, and just like setting up two mirrors facing each other, you can have an endless succession of size that way, from the 
uh, uh, micro universe that we can see through much smaller things and through macro universe to larger things and so on. And God is above beyond all of that. That's in a transcendental sense. But on the other hand, God is also imminent. So God says, and we are closer to the human being than his jugular vein. Or her jugular vein. And it says, And it says, And if my servants should ask you about me, then I am near, say I am near, I answer the call of the one who calls when he or she calls, and therefore let them respond to me and let them believe in me that they may be rightly guided. So, that expresses a very opposite tendency. If you have the God of the universe, people would say, oh, God can't be concerned with the humans at the, the, the uh, level of, of this mere pebble of a planet. It's way far beyond and above that. It's too great. But here, it's the opposite, because if God is all like that, then God can be concerned with every single thing. As it says also in the Quran, وَمَا تَسْقُطُوا مِنْ وَرَقَ إِلَّا يَعْلَمَهَا Not a single leaf falls except that he knows it. And so the um, uh, idea that God ranges from this to that, from very transcendent to very imminent, that is a concept also that is clearly found in Islam. Another thought about the universe is, when one considers the uh, universe, the, 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 the description of the universe that has been discovered by science, is not something that's friendly and nice at all. It's a place of extraordinary violence. And the violence that is discovered in it becomes greater and greater as more discoveries are, are, are found, where they find the, the radio <laughs> galaxies which turn out to have uh, black holes that where uh, the, the particles colliding with them are, are shot out uh, in two poles going out of the galaxy above and below it at nearly the speed of light. So violent is the, the interactions. All of the metals that are above element 26, iron, in the periodic chart, were created inside of supernovas. So all the gold that is in the, the fillings in the people's teeth, for example, and all of the elements that are in our bodies that were created in supernova explosions only, because the normal stellar processes can only get up to the element iron. So when you see this it, 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 it unbelievable degree of violence in the universe, and then we come back to the question of well, where is justice, where is fairness in the universe, we kind of, for myself, I'm kind of stunned like the description of the prophet Job in the book of Job, which is also found in the Quran, that uh, where God replies to, to, to Job, you know, have you measured everything? Do you understand everything? Who are you to talk to me like that? I mean, it's just something that the uh, enormous magnificence of God is, is so uh, tremendous that it is just something beyond uh, comprehension. But uh, when we come then and think about that, the violence of the universe, the dangerousness of the universe, that we're living and we're 93 miles away from this gigantic stellar fire that has a, a, a diameter 100 times uh, that of the Earth, uh, the Sun, I mean, and it is uh, it, it extremely uh, violent, hot, <coughs> dangerous, etc. Just and here we are living on this planet that has been here for uh, more than four billion years, where the life has existed on the planet for well, probably a billion years, and of course from the Cambrian age, the Paleozoic 500 million years ago with trilobites and large type creatures and so What? Nothing has happened? The sun hasn't set out a single ton of fire that just went and blew the place away? <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> or as one man said colloquially, it's a dad blamed miracle. And it is a stunning, amazing thing 
that there is such kind of destruction has happened. And when we go out and all the exoplanets that they've discovered lately, planets around other solar systems and so on, which is one of the most exciting things going on in astronomy right now, and you find that um, they thought red dwarf stars live a trillion years. Our sun only lives 10 billion. And so they could go a red dwarf star. Then they find the red dwarf stars all tend to be booster stars, which means they go <laughs> every now and then and destroy everything nearby in, its pa in their path. So it, it, they haven't found anything, in fact, that actually resembles our situation. It's astonishing. So if anyone wants to come up and say that God is not compassionate and has not had compassion on this planet for all that, and if one wants to examine the fact of death, as in the Quran, uh, every soul shall taste of death. Well, and it also says, Did we not make the earth a receptacle, living and dead, living things and dead things? And as the uh, poet Abu Ala al marri said in Arabic, they, uh, that uh, in a certain poem, lighten your step. I do not suppose that the surface of this earth is composed of anything except dead bodies. And so the whole planet is like, it's a charnel house. <laughs> it's, a, it's like a, a, a planet, like a morgue, okay? But live with it. That is the situation that we're actually in. It wasn't made for people to be everlasting. In fact, I remember when I was listening to Francis Collins, the um, head of the Human Genome Project, who himself is a scientist and a Christian, giving a lecture about uh, coming developments of science. This was some years ago. And he said, in 40 years, there will be no disease. We have completely eliminated all disease. There will be no virus and there will be no disease at all. He said this. I heard it. And he said, <laughs> and the average life expectancy will be 90 years. And I thought, OK, so now people then are going to have a work career of, say, 70 years instead of, say, uh, you know, 40 or 50 years. And so then how are, where are the jobs going to come? I mean, the society then will be distorted in certain ways. Arthur C. Clarke imagined a future universe in the book The City and the Stars, and a science fiction novel I've used for instruction before, uh, in which uh, humans had achieved mechanical reincarnation on the theory that if only material exists, then if you could exactly rearrange the atoms of a person, you could stamp out the same person again, right? And, and, and you could do that. And uh, uh, yet it seemed lacking in something because people weren't born anymore, they came out of the computer. How would we like having no babies, no children? I mean, that would be quite another type of world. So maybe it is something that we just kind of accept things, and that that uh, would uh, help us to get along uh, anyway. And there are numerous other uh, issues that arise. The uh, uh, a question of whether God is a person or God is a force. In Islam, that is answered in the Quran, where it says, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ لَكُمْ And your Lord said, Call on me and I will answer you. So in other words, prayer is authorized in Islam. It's not like you can say that there isn't prayer. And you may be able to make up some exploration that would still allow for a a pantheistic type explanation of things, but basically for Islam in general, it is more of the view of God is the God of person rather than God of force. When we say God of person, of course, this is called the personal God, and that is a sort of um, odd locution in English because it sort of means like, oh, I have this personal God right here in my pocket. Is this, you know, I really love him. And, uh, no, it means God is a person, not that it's a personal possession or something. Um, and um, so Islam comes down, I think, quite clearly on that particular issue. And the uh, issue of the efficacy of prayer, then, the efficacy of prayer is stated there. And I must say, as a Muslim coming up as a uh, as someone who embraced Islam uh, 40 years ago, and uh, 
came from a very non-religious type household and background, that was the hardest thing for me to be able to adopt the idea of the efficacy of prayer. But alhamdulillah, thank God, I have adopted it. And it is uh, something that I, I can, uh, can see and something certainly that the uh, masses of the, of the Muslims uphold and uh, believe in. And there are a lot of other things to say, but I don't want to take up more time as you take away from the question and answer period and so on. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Blankenship. Wow, is, is, is what I want to say. I can only believe that you are so I see some of you writing. Do you have your cards, your index cards? OK, you have those. Um, it, from, from a Christian, I, my perspective, Christian, I heard, I heard words um, from all three faiths of Abraham that rang very, very, very true to me and were extraordinarily familiar. So I'm hearing a lot of common. I can only believe that, that you are too. And it, it brought me back to that billboard, do you know where you're going? And maybe, maybe I do, maybe I don't. But it is that journey that we're invited to walk on in peace and with God as each of us knows him or defines him. And I'm feeling, and I don't know much, but I'm feeling pretty certain God will land us right where we're supposed to be. He knows where we're going. So I, we're going to take a little break here. Before we do, I would be very remiss if, if I didn't acknowledge um, the Islamic Center of Reading, St. Benedict's Church, Reform Congregation, Oheb Shalom, and the Reading Brooks Council of Churches, and of course, Alvernia University for hosting this. It is those organizations who also have stepped up and provided a platform in which all of us, can, can walk in peace and journey together. So you're invited to take a break, um, use the facilities, there are refreshments in the back. We're just gonna take about 10 minutes. And please feel free to write your questions. They can be about who is God or any other question that you have uh, or comment about your faith or another faith. And we will reconvene in exactly 10 minutes and uh, share those questions with our panelists this evening. Thank you. 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 Thank
begin again? I was just told it was a long 10 minutes, or a New York minute, but I think uh, everybody's relaxed and refreshed. I've always heard, and you may have heard this, your families, uh, your circles, when you get together, cocktail party or something like that, look, just don't talk about politics or religion, and you'll be good. Have you heard that before? That's off limits. Because it often lends itself to arguments. So this is so wonderfully refreshing because we're talking religion freely without any arguments, rather with a, a, a hunger for understanding, not only of other religions, but um, and a better understanding of our own faith. So it's a wonderful thing. Thank you very, very, very much for being here and for your participation. We have lots of questions. So without further ado, may we walk in peace in the second portion of our program. And I will ask this of our panelists. Is God male or female? <laughs> no, wait, there's more. Almost every speaker used he. And I think this is for um, Dr. Blankenship, because I bet you you do this in your class. Please show some passages to reinforce your answer. <laughs> All right. Well, um, the, in the Arabic language, there are only two genders, which are the masculine and feminine. So every single word, that is every noun, has to be either masculine or feminine gender. This is similar to French or Italian or Spanish also. And unlike German and English. And the um, uh, default gender is the masculine gender. So unless something is specifically feminine, it's construed as masculine. And therefore, it is, uh, the name for God is in the masculine gender. But that does not mean that God has gender in the view of the Muslims. The Muslim scholars have uh, completely denounced any idea that God has gender. God does not have gender, either male or female, even though the word itself has to have a gender because of the limitation of Arabic in that case. When we come to English, and we observe that English has, uh, although no gender in the nouns generally, but it does have he, she, and it as uh, pronouns, which resemble German, which has the, also uh, the, uh, neuter as a third gender. And that would raise the uh, discussion of why not discuss God as it. And the reason for that is that it's just a convention that God has been called he, which is possibly borrowed over from the language where it's in the masculine rather than the feminine. Uh, and personally, I would not mind referring to God as it. However, uh, that is something that people feel cold toward. And it isn't something where people, it makes people feel close to uh, God in that sense because of the conventions that we're accustomed to. So we have to deal with the conventions as we're accustomed to them. I guess that would be my answer. Rabbi, Father, would you like to elaborate from the backdrop of your faith? Certainly we would. Um, not, God does not have a gender as well. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, Jesus was male. And so for us, and Jesus uses uh, the, the teaches us that our father refers to the father as uh, to God as as his parent or his father, and so he he, he demonstrates this close intimate relationship uh, between uh, that we can have with God, and and does use the the parent image of a father in that. However, God as um, that uh, superior being um, would be without gender. He is all female and all male, uh, like. Arabic, Hebrew, to Hebrew, Hebrew only has a masculine and a feminine, and therefore God falls into one of the categories. The difference, I think, and we talked about this uh, before we started this evening formally, is the fact that uh, Hebrew and Judaism uses both uh, masculine and feminine names for God, depending on the circumstance, as opposed to saying that there are times where we come into contact with uh, the more uh, the more feminine aspects of God, uh, and therefore it is uh, a feminine name that is used. 
uh, versus a uh, uh, a more masculine uh, more masculine interpretation or or contact with God. So that will that would vary. But God in its God in God's self um, would really be genderless. Yeah, and if I could add that sometimes in medieval times the attributes of God would be divided between attributes of uh, uh, majesty and uh, uh, attributes of beauty, because God is majestic and is beautiful at the same time. So then some people would theorize that uh, the ma uh, aspects of majesty resemble or uh, represent the masculine attributes and the attributes of beauty, the feminine attributes. And now today, some feminists find this politically incorrect and, and sexist. And um, uh, it also might be noted that uh, certain Sufis, who are the mystical Muslims in the Middle Ages, used to compose poetry where they would refer to God by feminine names and compose poems that uh, for Christians or Jews might bear some resemblance to the Song of Songs and the idea that uh, uh, the poem sounds completely secular, yet it has in it or is given a, uh, a religious meaning. And all of that begs the question is, did you get the answer? As we contemplate the uncontemplatable, we'll go on. Uh, what does Islam and Judaism think of Jesus Christ? Well, uh, in Islam, Jesus is a prophet, and uh, he is uh, born uh, immaculately of the Virgin Mary. And so there are certain parallels to uh, Christian uh, ideas about Jesus Christ. And there are certain other items that are not uh, usual in the Christian story, but uh, those are mostly in the realm of details, of miraculous details. But the Muslims all honor Jesus Christ as a prophet, of course. And, uh, however, he's not regarded as deity. Rather, all of the prophets are equal in being human beings and not being deities. I often describe uh, Judaism's understanding of Jesus as an understanding of a, probably would have been a great rabbi. Um, a reformer, a teacher, um, who I don't believe, based on much of what is written within Christian scriptures, is necessarily try it that far from what Judaism teaches, and that he was unhappy with the Judaism he saw at the time and was trying to uh, bring it back closer to what he believed it should be. And so he was a great teacher, uh, and and I think we would use the term prophet not in the same, not necessarily in the same sense. Uh, because the era of prophecy theoretically ended according to Judaism after the time of Malachi, uh, but a, 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 a wise teacher. Uh, and the interesting part for us is when we reflect on much of what Jesus, Jesus teaches, so much of it um, resonates with Judaism. Thank you very much. Did God invent man, or did man invent God? I didn't write it. We can ponder that one if you like for a little bit and move on to the next question. So as to not put anybody in the spot. We'll hold that one. Um, am I correct in understanding that Islam does not believe in a creation. Well, in Islam, uh, God is referred to as al Khaliq, the creator. And so the creation is um, something that Muslims believe in, that there, is, that there was a creation. Uh, that would not, however, necessarily mean that that creation has to be one particular form of creation or another. So perhaps the questioner is referring to the fact that the uh, Muslims don't have the book of Genesis, so we don't have to you know, deal with Genesis creation quite. Although uh, some of the motifs in Genesis are also found in the Quran, so there's probably more parallel than difference there. But there is a 
uh, creation. In fact, it says a creation in six days, furthermore. Thank you. From the time of Abraham, what is the number of years between Abraham and Jesus and the number of years between Jesus and Muhammad? History. Um, Abra if, we were, if we are to take the, the biblical material at its word, and I say that as a, as a preface, um, we would guess we would guess that Abraham was about 1800 BCE, um, uh, about so up just under two th uh, two thousand years ago. Um, that would uh, Jesus was Jesus was born about four BCE. They believe right, about four BCE, and Muhammad um, the birth is six hundred or five sixty nine. Five sixty nine, roughly. So well, I agree that the received historical material. None of the, those dates are exactly certain. Uh, and the um, birth of Muhammad is based on the, the hadith that says he was 63 when he died. And his death, that is established in June 632. So uh, assuming that these are solar years because the Islamic lunar calendar had only been instituted that year or the previous year, uh, it would be 569 then. But then always one may have to give or take a thing. And as for the birth and the passing of Jesus, those are both uh, uncertain of dates. Uncertain that is, they're approximately known, but not exactly. Right. No, no, we don't know for sure. Thank you. This question is for Father Phil. Does the Bible teach that it's solely through Jesus that salvation can be obtained? And if so, do Christians believe that non-Christians can make it to paradise? We, call it <laughs> <laughs> we can feel the love, right? <laughs> Certainly, we personally relate to Jesus as our Savior. And so he is one whose action in our lives, you know, brings us to salvation. But in the great as we contemplate God, he is so much bigger than we could ever imagine. And so in God's greatness and mercy, he calls all people to himself. And so there is, there is room for he, he welcomes all. So the answer is yes. <laughs> this one I believe is for Rabbi. <laughs> this is like being in a hot seat, isn't it? <laughs> How do you think you're like Jeopardy? You want to see who's going to find another first? How do today's Jews feel about Warner Van Braun? I was wondering the same thing. I don't know. I don't know. I would need who, who first is Warner Van Braun, if you could. The German rocket scientist. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Related over to America and later collaborated with Walt Disney. <laughs> you got it? <laughs> and then we got Tinkerbell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to understand the origin of the question. <clears throat> well, he was a, a he was German scientist in the Nazi period. And, right. and then, like the other German scientists, well, there was some dispute about whether he tried to impede or to help the German rocket program and so on, or he had something to do with the V-2 rockets and things like that. Right. There is, there is discussion of the, the German scientists who, during the, uh, during the Holocaust, whether they worked for the Germans and aided them in in the production in in the uh, the Holocaust or pre pre prevented them from doing so. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, stories and materials, and and uh, Simon Wiesenthal made a career of uh, trying to find some of these men after uh, after the war um, who had been uh, brought in by the uh, American government and the Argentinian government and other governments all across. Uh, all across the world, uh, because they there had been a brain drain, and then all of a sudden they uh, it was oh we have op an opportunity to bring these great scientists in, especially as we were getting ready for the Cold War, and uh, you know we can u we can use them and we will we will shield them. The the question of the fact that our government did that is obviously one that raises a lot of questions um, uh, for us, because the question of you know um, uh, you know can you for can, do you forgive the 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 a, an a prior act for uh, the help that one might give you in the in the current moment? And that's a very uh, sticky ethical question. 
Thank you. Thank you. This question is, is for all three of you. When considering who God is, has any of you ever doubted that there is a God? Well, I, I don't think I've ever doubted that. I mean, my family weren't religious, but mm -hmm. um, I was the one in the family who was the, you know, the black sheep of the family because I liked religion from the beginning. <laughs> and so um, it just seemed right to me, that's all. Growing up in a religious family, um, God was always present. He was part of our family life as much as he was part of our church life. And so I can't recall a time either that I doubted his existence. I maybe, you know, struggled, you know, where is God or how do I, where is God in this issue or that situation? Um, and, and it was only, it was a question, it would remain a question that would lead me, eventually the question would lead me to an awareness of God's presence in that struggle or in that issue. Um, so I don't know that, I can't think of a time that it was, there was an absence or, or I said, you know, that I couldn't find God. I think it's an interesting question to ask. Uh, I think the answer, honestly, is have I asked the question? Yes. Um, uh, have I asked it for a long period of time? No. Um, the, because I think some of the challenge of being human is to say, I'm going to have that thought as I struggle with the question, as Father Phil said, where is God in this situation? And so I'm going to say, well, you know, if God's not, if God's not here, where is God? Um, uh, and I would be lying to you and lying to myself if I didn't say it crossed my mind. But the honest answer is, uh, I think part of that is the struggle that we are meant to have, is that it's about coming out the other side and being able to find the answer to the question or deal, uh, uh, come to grips with that particular moment. Um, you know, uh, as, as a member of the clergy, when you're standing by with a family, as a child dies, you're going to ask that question, right? You're going to wonder, where is God, right? Does, you know, am I, am I, you know, is everything that I do? But I go back, and for me, I take a certain level of comfort in the fact that the, one of the terms that's used for Jews, the older term, Israel, right? Yisrael, the Hebrew is. And Yisrael literally means to struggle with God. And it is meant, to, I think that tells us that we are constantly in struggle. That to ask questions is human. To, wa to wonder is human. It's, but it's, a, but, um, and that, that, that's okay. God gives us that permission um, to do so. And on that note of uh, struggle, begs this question. Why does God allow for such question and confusion and condemn to hell if you don't get it right? What is each of your understanding of hell? This one I can answer fairly easily. <laughs> <laughs> he is on it. <laughs> Judaism, Judaism does not have a concept of hell that is anywhere close to what Christianity believes. Uh, Judaism believes that the soul given to each of us is divine, is a reflection of the divine, and therefore ultimately is good. That what we do in our lives may cover up the, cover up the, the, divine, the, the divine in us, and that there is a time after death for repentance and, and for atonement to be done, but ultimately that soul is purified and returned to its source, is, return, is returned to God. So there is no concept within Judaism of eternal damnation. Um, it, it is, and this is not just a concept for Jews. This is uh, what Judaism teaches about everybody, that the, the righteous of all nations have a share in the world to come. Um, and so it is not just about being a Jew, it's about being uh, the, the best people that we can be. I think in some of our earlier talks, we said this might be our next one. Yes. Actually, that we would talk about these subjects at our next gathering. But um, I, I think, um, you know, in, in the whole process, is, is also comes, you know, down to our, we talked about this earlier tonight, the, the free will, the choosing to love or choosing not to love. And with that, it comes consequences. And, and um, if one completely abandons 
uh, the call to be a human person. And what is noble about being human is, is loving another person. And if someone completely abandons that completely, you know, we say there, that they, there's God, the, the judge, the God who is judged will, will judge them um, in, in inappropriate to the, the consequences to their actions. Um, so free will enables us and invites us to decide or to want to love God. And in that um, comes uh, the decision for every person um, and the consequences follows. The afterlife is uh, conceived as a way to um, explain the uh, uh, way in which God rights the wrongs of the world. The world, obviously, is not completely filled with justice. So if you imagine the chart of four uh, characteristics where you have a person is uh, uh, good and uh, lives a, a life well, and so they have a good fate in the world, this world, uh, then that's seen as being deserved, you know, fate. And if they live a bad life in this world and have a bad end, then that's seen as being de deserved also. But what if they live a bad life and have a good end? They laugh all the way to the bank. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what if they, uh, you know, uh, they live a good life and then the, the, uh, suffer uh, and so on? Well, in the afterlife, then all the accounts are righted. And it said nobody will be wrong the grain, the weight of a mustard seed. So that there, there's a, a writing of accounts and the balancing out of accounts in, according to the judgment. Now that, of course, does not nearly exhaust this question because there are a lot of other aspects of it as well that might be problematic. But I think that uh, what was kind of suggested by the father here, uh, that if one is, um, uh, you know, sunders oneself from God by their own the, the will, then that puts them in the, the problematic and troublesome position. It is that we have a kind of duty to try to seek God. As it says in the Quran, I did not create the, uh, the spirits, and, uh, which is the jinn and humankind, except that they worship me. Well, we're talking about the Quran. There's a question here. How much of the Old Testament is in the Quran, and how much of the New Testament is in the Quran? Now, that's an excellent question, very pertinent. And it is um, um, something that was not much focused on classically by anybody. That is, the different religions and their polemics against each other tended to not study the texts of the other. And the idea of going in to study the texts of the other and criticize them and so on and, uh, it is uh, kind of a modern concept, so that kind of uh, comes out now. Some uh, Christian polemicists will try to argue that it says, uh, you know, we sent down the book, and the book, that means the Bible. Well, actually, it doesn't necessarily mean the Bible. It means a book, but it doesn't specify which one. Uh, and in the Quran, it specifies quite definitely that the Torah was given to Moses and the Psalms were given to David and the gospel, singular, was given to Jesus Christ. And that would seem to offer some authorization of those particular parts of the Bible as sacred texts. One could go further and say that at the time of Muhammad, there were a, number of, a large number of different gospels circulating, parallel texts of several of which appear in the Quran. Uh, including non-canonical ones. Uh, with regard to the Torah, though, by the time of Muhammad, it was pretty much set. And so the uh, idea of the uh, Torah, at least, being a, a sacred literature, revealed literature, that would seem to be something that's fairly set. Yet, if one wanted to try to minimize what the Muslims acknowledge in the text, and because there is inter-religious polemic going on about this, so that does happen, because one's always, you know, when polemicists are trying to seek advantage over each other uh, in this way. So the very famous Muslim uh, of the 20th century, uh, Maududi, who lived from 1903 to 1979, the Pakistani, who wrote a commentary on the Quran that's been available in English called Tafimul Quran, uh, states that, oh, 
the uh, parts of the Torah where it's just described the movements of the Israelites and so on, those aren't divine. It's only when God is speaking in the first person that it's divine text. And, that, and so, well, as far as I can tell, that's a completely new idea that was never uh, vetted or considered before that Maududi came up with himself. And that does show the variety of, of possibilities of answers on this. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, non-gospel literature from the New Testament, that's completely uh, ignored by Muslims, letters of Paul and so on. It's not considered to be sacred writ, although the Koran, in, in some respects, bears a, a great deal, of, or bears a certain resemblance to the book of Revelation. Uh, maybe more than it does to many other parts of the Bible. So, you know, it's just sort of like, go figure. One final <laughs> note I want to add is that um, the Quran also contains a passage that possibly uh, could be considered to uh, acknowledge the, uh, 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 what the uh, uh, scriptural quality of the Talmud, because it says that we, we uh, uh, wrote down or alternative explanation, we decreed for the children of Israel that uh, uh, whoever uh, takes a life without a, a due cause, it's as if they've killed all of mankind and if they or humankind, and whoever saves a life, it's as if they've saved all of the humankind, which is a, a Talmudic parallel. So many times we look for the bestseller list and a book to read. It makes you want to read all three. So you learn a little bit more. Study. This question is for you, Father Phil. You mentioned to Carl Reiner, can you give us a brief explanation about God as transcendental, and if it is similar or different from the transcendental idea in Islam that Dr. Blankenship spoke about? Um, Carl Reiner, you spoke about the Trinity and the, I mean, when I refer to the eminent and the economic, uh, his understanding of, I wonder if that's what they meant by that question. But um, the trans transcendental is God above and beyond um, our comprehension, and that, but at the same time, mystery that calls and pulls us into understanding and experiencing that at the same time. Um, so God is, the, uh, it's I and thou, God is always um, the other. Is it the same or different? Then Dr. Blankenship described, and maybe you could speak better to that? I, Is that the same? I don't know anything about the theology of Karl Rahner, <laughs> and so I'm not able to address that particular point. Okay, thank you. This one is for all three of you. How do you know, beyond a shadow of doubt, that your religion is the only true religion? <laughs> what is each of your personal journeys to your respective faiths? Well, the latter question is really big. Can we give the synopsis, the cliff notes for that one so that we can carry on? Because that is, you could spend an evening sharing your personal faith journey. That's a really tough one. Is there maybe one thing you might be able to hone in on that, that on your personal journey that said, this is, this is where my energy belongs? Well, I became convinced that Islam was the, the truth when I was reading the Quran, and that resonated with me as being the inheritor of the 4,000 years of the uh, development of uh, uh, scriptural uh, ideas and, and uh, religious ideas in the Semitic Near East. And to me, it seemed to resonate with me and spoke to me directly. That's the very short answer. That's a good one, there's thank you. There's a lot more than that. What was the first part? Oh, how do you know for sure that yours is the only true religion? Yeah. Well, I think, it, to me, it's the clearest religion. And so that's my preference. But, of course, it, there is a verse in the Quran that says that, 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 that those who believe and those who are Jews and the Christians and the Sabaeans, whoever believes in God in the last day, uh, they have, the, the, and, does, and uh, does right, they have their reward with their Lord, and no fear shall come upon them, neither shall they grieve, which there is a go. basis for uh, the uh, consideration of other religions as well. Uh, of course, the traditional religions in general, 
traditionally have excluded others and said there is no salvation outside the faith. And that's because they're rivals to each other and so on and trying to claim followers and adherents. But uh, maybe now we're coming to a, a, a kind of uh, uh, a slightly different position about that. And, um, uh, and there is, you know, a little bit of uh, room there uh, in, you know, considering the, the uh, aspects of validity in the faith of the other. And part of that is considering that the peoples of the book have part of the truth. And so their religions, therefore, are licit and where... Islam was the religion of rule that they should be allowed to continue to be practiced. So uh, there's some uh, opening there at any rate. And um, uh, but to me, that's where I've been guided to. So that's all I can say. So you you, you address the, the doubt that your religion is the only true religion through there's validity of other well, religions that's, that's, as you study. Well, yeah, I, it, I don't, uh, let me put it this way too, uh, once I had an evangelical Christian student who actually had gone to Liberty University of Jerry Falwell and worked as a policeman in Lynch Lynchburg, Virginia to, to uh, uh, support himself while he was doing that, and I think his father was a, a pastor, you know, a very conservative person and so on, and um, he uh, was quite shocked to find that I had, you know, become a Muslim and that I had practiced Christianity at one time and then became a Muslim and was very, uh, you know, kind of uh, disappointed. And he said, well, about the, you know, exclusiveness of faith, he said, well, I know this works. I can't guarantee your religion works, but I can say I guarantee that my religion works. So, and I thought, well, that's pretty good. I thought, that's pretty good. <laughs> because, you know, he was saying, I can guarantee, I guarantee that this works because I know this works for me, that I have faith in that, but I can't guarantee that your religion works. But he wasn't saying it didn't work either, right. so. Father, Rabbi, you want to address that and then Later, he wrote to me and said that he had uh, uh, given up his uh, offer of a tenure job at Taylor University because they required him to sign a paper saying he believed in the plenary inspiration of the Bible and he couldn't believe in that any longer. And that was a very, you know, moving thing when I read that. I felt, you know, a lot of pathos in that because it was such a big change. Right. A lot of spiritual writers talk about this idea of the pilgrim and the pilgrim is someone who searches for truth. And searching for truth, you find God. And so we're all, everyone in the face of the earth, every, everyone here, we're, we're pilgrims. We're, we're searching for truth. And so, and I think if, if there's anything that we see in these, these dialogues is there, there's truth here at the table in, 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 every, in every one of us. And so we, we are searching. We search for God. And in searching for God, we, we all find some truth that defines us and helps us. Um, to understand God in our life and how he calls us and challenges us to, to be God's people. As far as my spirit, my own private personal journey, um, you know, it, it, right, that could take a long time, but um, I, I, what they call a cradle Catholic. So I was born into, you know, as my parents, my grandparents, everybody was, was Catholic. And so you, you just, you just, a lot of it happened even in, you know, infancy, the baptism. And so things happen without you even knowing it. But I think it comes to a point in every Christian's life, um, this is what my parents value. This is what they passed on to me. Now, do I believe it? And I think every single person has struggled with that a little bit. Do I really believe that? And when we say yes, that's a very big moment of truth for that individual. And so um, there's been many moments of truth along my spiritual journey. And, and, and I think to, to be a, a priest, um, it's certainly that uh, most of that happened like during college years, uh, specifically um, my senior year in college. Great moments of truth that I felt now God was, it wasn't something my parents did, it was something God was doing for me and with me. On a personal level, my own journey, thinking back to the moment I can say, uh, I looked at my face and I, faith and I said it makes sense to me. Um, uh, I go back to a, a moment. I was a 16-year-old living. Uh, I had uh, partic was participating in a program 
where um, I was going to high school in Israel. Um, I had, was living in a small development town in the south with, um, uh, you might refer to them as some of the forgotten immigrants, um, uh, communities from uh, Libya, Morocco, and um, uh, other, parts of, other parts of North Africa. And uh, one of the things that the community took on the responsibility for was a certain level of self-policing. Um, and uh, I participated with my um, classmates in, do, in doing this. And there was one of those moments as you watch sunri sunrise, over the, sunrise over the desert uh, in a land that, uh, in the land of Israel, uh, for me was one of those moments I said, uh, it, there was a certain light bulb went off um, where I said it makes sense to me. Um, uh, uh, and so that I would look at as in a kind of a personal moment. Judaism responds to the question of are we the only right way? The answer is no. We are one of them. Um, we are right for us, but not necessarily right for you. Um, and what we ask of the world is, is you give us our right to believe and practice as we, as, as we believe we should. And we will hopefully give you that. We will hopefully give you that same in return, um, and that there should be that kind of mutual respect. Um, that there, um, uh, there never was within Judaism, and I think part of this comes from being a minority faith. Um, uh, very rarely, and very rarely, the you know, in the majority, therefore, uh, uh, always subject to somebody else. Um, and therefore, you say that's fine. You live your way. We'll li we'll live uh, we'll live our way, and and let's try let's try and get along. That doesn't mean that there were not struggles with their with various things and various ideas that were expressed over time. But for the most part, Judaism has always had this kind of live and let live uh, approach. On that, um, let's try and get along note. Can you foresee peace in the Middle East? <laughs> Please say yes. <laughs> I think we all want to hear yes. I, I pray for it. Yeah. I pray for it. I pray for it. Well, yes. We can say yes. <laughs> but I think we can say. I, I think we can say yes. Do. I don't know if I hold if I hold out hope for it soon, um, uh, uh, but if we can get to if we can go back, all of us can go back to core values, where peace beco where peace becomes the value that, that that motivates us. I at least want to believe that there's the hope the hope for it. So we are all hopeful. That's a good thing. Um, how are you feeling with time? I'm all right. Are you all right? <laughs> There's just a few more questions. We'll sneak them in. Are there any special attributes of Allah that Muslims refer to to bring them closer to knowing Allah? Uh, well, there could be, because, uh, of course, in certain uh, the practices that are uh, uh, what would be called supererogatory practices that people practice, uh, they might concentrate on particular names of Allah to uh, bring themselves closer to Allah. So, for example, uh, uh, one could uh, uh, emphasize the uh, names that uh, God calls himself in the Quran, who he says the uh, all-compassionate, the merciful, as uh, names that are referred to continuously. And there's also a hadith about the greatest name of God, which is either differently interpreted as either being a mysterious name that is unknown or else is just the name Allah, and that that's the uh, name which is used to bring people uh, closer to Allah. And to uh, chant the names of Allah is one form of dhikr, which means a remembrance or reminder <laughs> that is a uh, kind of uh, a practice because one should uh, try to be, as a Muslim, constantly conscious of God at all times. And if one can achieve the consciousness of God at all times, then one would really 
uh, break through to a status of excellence. So God says in the Quran, "Fadkuruni adkurkum washkaruli wala takfurun," which means, "Remember me that I may remember you, and give thanks to me, and do not be an ingrate to me." So the idea of remembrance, therefore, is uh, very important in that. And the Muslim worship is for the purpose of remembrance of God, as it says. Uh, to uh, uh, Moses in the, the Surah 20, um, uh, perform the, the Salat for my remembrance. And it says in another verse, in the Salat, that Salat or worship uh, prevents uh, flagrant and forbidden acts, but the remembrance of God is greater. So it's more important to remember God at all times. And we'll wrap it up this evening with this last question. It is, it is for all of our panelists. We're setting the stage here in Matthew 15, verse 15 to 18. Christ asks Peter, but whom do you, Peter, say that I am? And Peter replies, thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered, Blessed art thou, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. The only way to know God is through revelation from God. What is revelation according to each of the panelists? Does that principle apply to the theology of your religion today? Well, people can have contact with God through revelation, which is wahi, that is given to the prophets only, or there could be ilhem, which is a kind of divine inspiration, and that itself might be translated as revelation also. And of course, God may answer people's prayers, and uh, people may have conversations with God, and so on, so that there's quite a uh, possibility of uh, contact with God in uh, different ways. And what usually when we restrict the term revelation to only the prophets, so then we mean that if uh, God is sending some kind of book as guidance that comes to a prophet, and that is a special form of revelation, maybe that's you know for general distribution. But that doesn't mean that individual people don't have uh, direct contact with God either. Everyone, when they're worshiping, is directly in contact with God. For us, the the fullest. Um form of revelation would be Jesus Christ uh, revealing to us God and and um, you know God teaches us how to pray and in that prayer it's communication with God and so that's a two-way street us speaking to God God speaking to us and so I, I think there are moments of revelation there's moments of God revealing himself to us um, in the in those times of prayer uh, public prayer or even private prayer when we're alone pondering the mystery of God um, whatever insights we have, it, it would be considered a part of the of God revealing Himself uh, to us. Revelation, as a term, is traditionally assigned to uh, the the giving of Torah to Moses on Mount Sinai, and then, uh, to some extent, in that kind of face to face relationship that Moses has with God, uh, uh, speaks of a special. Uh, status of that material. That's not to say that the rest of, Jew, the Jew, uh, of the Hebrew Bible is less important. It is just doesn't stand in that same revealed material, that same level of revelation of that direct conversation between God and, and Moses. The, the uh, revelation is believed to be ongoing and we are taught that the, uh, the work to understand the world in which we live and to answer the questions that we have is part of the ongoing revelation. Uh, the question of whether or not that is um, uh, the hearing of a voice as Moses did, um, I'm, not I'm, I'm not as sure about. Um, you know, personally, I think if you tell people you, God is speaking to you these days, uh, you end up at Warnersville. Um, uh, but that I do believe that God communicates with us, uh, but just not in ways that I would say is equal to that of a Moses or, or the prophets. I think we could all look around the room, look at each other, behind us, in front of us, 
surely our panelists and see God. I think he is in this room. I thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and your expertise and toughing out some difficult questions and being put on the spot. Appreciate it very much, Dr. Blankenship, Father Phil, Rabbi Michelson. Thank all of you for coming this evening. Pleasure as always.